Welcome, welcome beloved in Jesus Christ. Greetings wherever you are and trusting and hoping that you are well and continuing to trust in God. Beloved, welcome to today's worship service of Sunday 13 September 2020 with myself, Pastor T. Rabari as the worship leader. So I trust and hope that wherever you are, whatever time, uh, indeed, God is able to bless you through this worship service. Beloved, let us begin by seeking God's help and blessing as we continue to worship on this day of rest, the day of the Lord. <clears throat> Our eyes are lifted upward and we ask ourselves, where will our help come from? Our help comes from Jehovah, the Lord God who created heaven, earth, and all that exists. Beloved, may the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God our Father be with you through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us get into worship and sing the song from Sifilasasioni number 11. Bokang Modimo Wahanya, praise to God uh, who is glory, uh, God who uh, created us and all that he does uh, is glorious. Bokang Modimo Wahanya. Let us unite together and say together our Christian belief, our Christian faith, as God has revealed himself to us in his word and unites us um, with himself in faith and also we are united together in this same belief. Today let us recite the Apostles' Creed in English. Let us say from hearts that believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beloved, let us read God's law, reminding each other of God's covenant. We will use the passage in the Gospel of Luke, 
the Gospel of Luke chapter 10, where we'll read from verse 25 until verse 37. Luke chapter 10, where we get summary of the law and also the parable or story of the uh, merciful or good Samaritan and it is teaching us to apply or live out the, the law of God, the law of love, but also to see God as the good Samaritan, as the one who's compassionate and merciful by sending Jesus to save us and that is why we love him and that is why we know what love is. Uh, Luke chapter 10 from verse 25 to verse 37, it reads as follows. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, But who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Amen. Beloved, let us respond to the reading, the reminder of God's law, uh, calling us to love God to know God's love, but also to respond to God's love by loving others. Um, by singing the song from Nyimbo Zabat Endi number 151, Wumfuna Zwi
Beloved, before we come to the reading of scripture, let us uh, first pray. I will lead you uh, in prayer. Let us close our eyes wherever you are and come before the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> o Jehovah, our God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, eternal God, almighty God, you are everywhere present and know everything. You are Jehovah. You were there, you are there, and you will continue to be there. Jehovah, thank you for giving us knowledge of you, revelation of you, faith in you. That is why we are here to worship in response to your revelation, calling us to know you, to be in covenant with you, to receive salvation in Jesus Christ. And here we are, through your mercy and grace and love, we are called your children. And we cry out to you, Abba, Father, hear us. And indeed, we are assured that in the name of Jesus, you hear us, you are with us. We thank you knowing that you are holy God and we are sinners. We transgress your commands many times and in many ways. Even the command to love you and to love others, we fail miserably in doing what you require. O oh, Jehovah, forgive us of our sins and wrongdoing. Forgive us, help us to repent, transform us, help us to grow. Help us to reflect you. Help us to walk according to your commands in whatever place, situation, relationship and time you have put us in. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Help us not to look down on your mercy and grace. Help us indeed to be motivated by your love so that indeed we love you and love doing your commands. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the past days and nights. We thank you for the day of rest, the day of worship, the day of the Lord. Bless it indeed. Help us to grow in faith, in knowledge that you are the creator. You are the sustainer. You are the provider. You conquer death when Jesus rose from the dead, showing us that indeed our sins are paid for. In Jesus there is justification. In Jesus there is hope of eternal life. O oh God, you give us rest and peace. On our own we can't do it. That's why we look to you for provision, for sustenance, for care. We also look to you for salvation, for redemption from sin and the effects of sin. And that is why we pray to you asking for peace and rest. We pray to you, O oh God, that you be with us even when we come to the reading of your word, which we believe is living and true and active. May it have impact and effect in our lives, in our hearts and minds. Change us, nourish us, strengthen us. Where we are going astray, call us back. Where we are tired, refresh us through your word. We know that your word is wisdom. Oh God, we submit to it. May you direct us to do your will. Give us wisdom so that in every situation we take the right decision and right path to honor you, to please you, and to serve you. We thank you for calling us your servants, choosing us as church, redeeming us in the blood of Jesus and uniting us in the Holy Spirit and in the faith that Jesus is our Savior and Lord. Help us to indeed live out that faith help us to be salt and light in the world to be ambassadors of jesus christ through the witness and the good works we do may your name be praised help us everywhere we are in our homes in our workplace in our schools that as we are fulfilling our callings doing our responsibilities we do everything to your glory we do everything knowing that we are to please you. We ask, O oh God, that you care for us. Oh, we 
are people with weak bodies. We get sick, we get tired, we get old. Give us strength, O oh God. We ask for healing. Even in these times where we continue to talk about the pandemic of coronavirus, O oh God, we ask for help. Have mercy on us. We thank you that there is change, there is decrease in number of those who are being infected. We thank you for that and we praise you for that, O oh God. And we continue to ask that you protect us. Protect those who are helping in their health, in caring for the sick. Those who are sick, O oh God, we ask for their healing. We pray knowing that as people we get sick and we die. We know that even though it's painful. And that's why we cry asking for comfort. Give us hope. Knowing that Jesus Christ has defeated death when he rose from the dead. And now we look to death and we say, where is your victory? And we look forward knowing that there is a resurrection of the body. There is eternal life with you. Oh God, help us to persevere, to endure, to run the race, to be faithful. Help us as you have called us throughout the journey. Even here in South Africa, oh God, as church, help us to work with our government, to encourage our government to do the right thing. And indeed, all leaders of different industry, different sectors of society, help them to do the right thing, to fulfill their responsibilities in the right way, so that those they are leading can benefit from their leadership. We ask, oh God, that you be with our government, our political leaders, to do the right thing, to take the right decisions, decisions that benefit all citizens of this country. Help us to share in the resources that you have given us in South Africa so that we continue to fight against poverty and we uplift each other. Help us to fight against greed and corruption. Help us, O oh God, to be transparent. We pray for protection, O oh God. Help us against violence and crime, especially even those who are women and children and other vulnerable who are being oppressed and hurt by those they are, who are supposed to protect them. And that's why we pray, O oh God, that you change our hearts and minds so that we look at other human beings as human beings, as your image, and we respect life and we respect each other. We pray, O oh God, that you be with us, even though we are different color, language, and culture, that indeed we accept each other and we can work together. Help us, O oh God, that we work together to build this country. We cry also about our economy that is weak. We pray also that it grow, give us wisdom, give us to persevere. Even in these times where there is talk of job losses and time it will take for the economy to grow, help those who are seeking employment and doing business. Help us, O oh God, provide for us. We thank you and we ask you, O oh God, that indeed be with other governments and countries their citizens, especially places where there is war. We pray, O oh God, that there be peace, that those who are in fighting come together and live together. We hear also of disasters, floods, and fires that destroy. We know that everything that happens, even disasters, is under your control and according to your knowledge and purpose. And you remind us that this world, indeed, everything can go. But Indeed, on the name of Jesus, on Christ, who is the solid rock, our hope stands. And that is why, O oh God, even in the midst of disasters, help us, O oh God, even help us to help others who are in need, who go through difficulties. We pray also for your church all over the world, our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted by the people in power and persecuted for the faith. We pray for them that you be the answer to their prayers. Also use us in answering their prayers. Help them to be faithful and to endure throughout all situations in holding on to Christ and saving you. We ask, O oh God, that you also help us. Talk to us through your word all the time. Guide us. 
In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Beloved, let us continue in this worship service. We continue and we come to the reading of the scripture for today. We are reading in the Old Testament. We are going to read in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 13. We are looking at chapter 13 verse 1 to 46 and chapter 14 verse 1 to 32. But I'm not going to read all those verses. We will read chapter 13 um, from verse 1 to 17 and also verse 45 and 46 and also in chapter 14 uh, we will only read from verse 1 to 20. Leviticus chapter 13 we are reading verse 1 to 17 and verse 45 and 46 Leviticus 14 verse 1 to 20 but in actual fact the message of today we are basing on the scripture of Leviticus 13 verse 1 to uh, 46 and also Leviticus 14 verse 1 to 32 I read using the English Standard Version. It reads as follows. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns out into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of his sons the priest, and the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white, and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body, and appears no deeper than the skin, and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days, and the priest shall examine him on the seventh day, and if in his eyes the disease is checked, and the disease has not spread in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up for another seven days, and the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day. And if the diseased area has faded, and the disease has not spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean it is only an eruption and he shall wash his clothes and be clean but if the eruption spreads in the skin after he has shown himself to the priest for his cleansing he shall appear again before the priest and the priest shall look and if the eruption has spread in the skin then the priest shall pronounce him unclean it is a leprous disease when a man is afflicted with a leprous disease, he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall look. And if there is a white swelling in the skin that has turned the hair white, and there is raw flesh in the swelling, it is a chronic leprous disease in the skin of his body, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. And if the leprous disease breaks out in the skin, so that the leprous disease covers all the skin of the diseased person from head to foot, so far as the priest can see. Then the priest shall look, and if the leprous disease has covered all his body, he shall pronounce him clean of the disease. It has all turned white and is clean. But when raw flesh appears on him, he shall be unclean. And the priest shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him unclean. Raw flesh is unclean for it is a leprous disease. But if the raw flesh recovers and turns white again, then he shall come to the priest, and the priest shall examine him, and if the disease has turned white, then the priest shall pronounce the diseased person clean. He is clean. Then verse 45 and 46. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! 
He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Let us also read in chapter 14. Chapter 14, we are reading from verse 1 to 20. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Then if the case of the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean beds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the beds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bed with cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bed in the blood of the bed that was killed over fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bed go into the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe himself in water. And he shall be clean. And after that he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent seven days. And on the seventh day he shall shave off all his hair from his head, his beard, and his eyebrows. He shall shave off all his hair, and then he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two male lamps without blemish, and one ewe lamp a year old without blemish, and a grain offering of three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, and one log of oil. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed, and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering, along with the log of oil, and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering, in the place of the sanctuary. For the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is mostly, most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it on the palm of his right hand, and dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left and, and sprinkle some oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And some of the oil that remains in his hand, the priest shall put on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the hand, head of him who is to be cleansed. Then the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. The priest shall offer the sin offering to make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness, and afterward he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. Amen. Let us end there in verse 20 of chapter 14. Beloved, as we mentioned uh, last week, um, we are looking at this passage or part of scripture in Leviticus during this month. And it is so that we can be reminded that the word of the Lord provides lessons that guide us in what to consider when we look at culture. Uh, culture is the response to our environment and how we do things, uh, how we come to, to understand life. And then we have traditions, we have heritage, we have things that we pass on, um, we, we learn and we pass on to the next generation. But also how to view various events in our life and even in the community's life. So in this passage of Leviticus 13 and 14, 
um, which we read only verse 1 to 17 and also in chapter 14 verse 1 to 20. We must ask and answer the question, what does the Lord teach us from these laws regarding leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed? What is it that God wants us to see? I know that it is very stressful when you talk of matters of health, when you have to go to the doctor and you have to do some tests, you have to be tested. It is stressful because when you are told that you are sick and you have to be hospitalized or you have to do an operation or it is a chronic disease, a disease or sickness that um, it will take time to heal or might not heal, uh, it is a very stressful time. Health is a very important thing to us as human beings especially even in these times, recent times, we're talking of coronavirus. Um, health is important, but it is also important to God. And that's why we hear these commands, these laws regarding uh, leprosy. But when we read here in chapter 13 and 14, it is more than health. It is more than just about health, but it is about being declared unclean and clean. And as I explained in the previous part or Sunday where we were looking at Leviticus 12. What does it mean to be clean and what does it mean to be unclean? It is about the ritual or ceremonial status of a person um, where if you are unclean, it means that you can't participate in the worship services. You can't come before God. It means that you are in a condition that is unacceptable. You have something in you that hinders you, that stops you from coming before God. Something which stops you or makes you unworthy uh, to participate not just in worship but also in the covenant community or the life of the community. So the various laws which talk about being clean and unclean, various situations that make a person to be unclean, it was to remind people that by the way, Jehovah is holy. He is unique. And he must be worshipped uh, the way God wants. The way God is pleased about. We are reminded by these laws and various situations that make us unclean or that make people to be pronounced unclean. That we are sinners. We can't come before God uh, as we are. And those things which make us not to come before God, which make God not to accept us, must be taken from us so that we are clean, so that God looks at us as clean. So these laws were pointing forward to the coming of Jesus, where Jesus will die, he will shed blood, and that death of Jesus has fulfilled all the sacrifices, all the shedding of blood, which was necessary to cleanse people of various situations that might make them unclean, unworthy to be accepted by God. So today there is no need to kill a goat, a, a sheep, a, a lamb, so that you do cleansing process, cleansing ritual, so that you are accepted by God. No, we don't need that. Jesus has died. Only faith in Jesus is enough for you to be cleansed, to be holy, to be accepted by God. Now, when we read the Old Testament, as I said and I repeat today, uh, we must read it in light of what Jesus has come and done. And even here, when we read Leviticus 13 and 14, um, we must also understand why did Jesus have to come and have to die. And also we can realize yeah, Jesus achieved for us great thing. Because if Jesus had not come, then for us to be accepted by God, we would have to do these rules. We would have to follow these laws. But now Jesus has come and has achieved this process. It is no longer necessary. This process was pointing to Jesus who will come and do for us. And because he has achieved we no longer are bound by these rules. So it is something where you realize not just what was needed for you to be accepted by God, 
but also what was achieved by Jesus. And then it's something that must motivate you and I to love God, to honor God, to thank God. In all areas of our lives, we must obey God as covenant people, um, giving ourselves to God. Now, when we talk of leprosy, when we hear of leprosy, leprosy, you must understand that in the Bible, when it talks of leprosy, it is not just one disease, one infection. But it was actually a name that was covering uh, various skin infections, uh, not just one disease. Of course, today, there is a, a, a disease called leprosy, um, or some people call it Hansen's disease, because of a man called Hansen who discovered in his research that this disease, which they call leprosy, is caused by a bacteria. Uh, it's called Mycobacterium leprae. Uh, that gem or that organism, that bacteria, causes this kind of disease which is called leprosy. So leprosy or Hansen's disease was, is also a, a skin infection. But it's long term. It causes sores. It causes damage to nerve system uh, of the arm and, and, and everything. And it affects the eyes sometimes and even the, um, the, the respiratory uh, system. So it is a serious disease. And obviously because now uh, of advanced medical research and ability, we have also cure for, for that. So you, you can go and read about that. I'm not going to talk about leprosy, Hansen's disease. But the point I'm making is that this Hansen's disease or leprosy is not the same as this one's year. Uh, this term called leprosy was covering various skin infections, which if you had them, you were determined, pronounced that you are unclean. So some who know medicine and know biology, when they read the symptoms which are mentioned here, they can be able to try and identify the various sicknesses that are mentioned here in Leviticus 13. But for us, when we read here, let us learn about being unclean and being clean. And also about health. Uh, some of these uh, things help us to realize ourselves, our health, but also God how we are with God and how we must respond to those maybe major uh, health uh, scares, health events, uh, health or sickness situations uh, using our faith. Now, there are six things which I want us to see when we have read here about what does God teach us regarding from these laws regarding leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed. The first thing is that the laws regarding leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed, show that covenant people of God, the redeemed, the ransomed, can be affected by sickness, even sickness of leprosy, but even other sicknesses. So this passage of Leviticus 13, it is mentioning instances where it is people of God, would come uh, and be examined and the priest will determine that based on your symptoms you are having leprosy. Even the priest could have leprosy and then they will be unfit for service. Of course there are instances in the Bible where leprosy was a punishment for people who didn't obey God. If you read Numbers chapter 12, Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, when she was rebelling, saying, but how come God only talks to Moses? We are older than Moses. And Moses has married an, a woman from another nation. Why does God talk to Moses only? So she was challenging the leadership of Moses and God punished her with leprosy. And when you read in Numbers chapter 12, the people had to wait for her to be healed and then they can move. You can also read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 15, King uh, Azariah uh, also was punished by um, leprosy. King Uzziah also in 2 Chronicles 25, verse 16 to 21, because he was also challenging the work of the priests, saying, no, 
I, I can also give sacrifices in the temple. And as he was doing it, he was struck by leprosy. And the rest of his life, he was sick and he had to live in a separate room. And his son took over as the king. So I'm mentioning that, that yes, there are instances where people get sick, punished because of God punishing them because they didn't obey God. But it's not every time that when you look at sickness, serious sickness, and other serious uh, painful things, that you say, oh, yeah, you are being punished. You have done something wrong. No. Sometimes we will be sick. We will have, people will have leprosy or sickness, which is serious. Not because of anything wrong, but because we are here on earth. And even when we have Jesus Christ, when we have faith, when we are saved, we can still get sick. Because there are people who think, you know, that, no, once you are in Jesus, the blood of Jesus, it means that you will never get sick. I don't know how they read the Bible. But here in this passage, we see that, by the way, the Israelites had just been liberated. Saved in a miraculous way from slavery in Egypt. They were being led by God by cloud in the afternoon and in the night cloud of, of or, or pillar of fire they even had moses who was a very big prophet but yet you find this laws that say when there is leprosy when you have this kind of situation come to the priest so that you are checked and you might find that you have leprosy why this loss they're showing that it is possible it will happen that as people of god as church of God, yes, you are saved, you are redeemed, you have God, but it can be affected by leprosy and other sicknesses. And even when the people will get into Canaan, the promised land, yes, they are coming from Egypt, they are in the desert, now they are going to Canaan. It doesn't mean that when they reach Canaan, there is no more sickness. There will be sickness. Leprosy, these rules were meant also for the time when they will be in Canaan. I'm reminding this so that we see that we are still on earth. The only place where there is no sickness, there is no leprosy, is heaven. Here on earth, we are still going to be affected by sickness. And these rules remind us of that. And we must look forward to the full redemption. We have started to get the deposit. But there is full redemption, full salvation where we are going to get all the benefits of salvation. And one of those benefits, or the full benefits, is that no more sickness, no more death. Let us read in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 verse 23. And it says, And not only creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So the law is reminding us, also, was also reminding the church even in the Old Testament, they can't save themselves. Yes, they are saved. They need redemption. They must trust in God, but there is full redemption that is to come. And we must thank God. We must thank Jesus Christ because in him, healing is possible. Healing happens. We can be cleansed. And there is perfect eternal healing. I'm not talking here on earth where you're going to get sick and get healed. You're going to get sick and get healed. You're going to get sick and get healed. That is the process of human beings here on earth. But I'm talking of eternal perfect healing. It's coming. And that's why when you read the Revelation chapter 21 it talks of covenant. It talks using covenant language. Covenant language is about relationship. You are my God. You are my people. That is covenant language. I am your God. You are my people. And in Revelation 21 verse 3 to verse 4, it then says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He, God, will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall they be mourning no crying, no pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Faith in Jesus makes us to look forward and to desire that state to be with God fully. 
No more pain. No more crying. No more crying and pain from this leprosy. But the second thing which we must learn from this loss regarding leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed, is that we must submit to the standard of God, to the way of God. We must submit, we must put ourselves under to follow the requirements of God regarding worship, regarding life. What God determines to be holy and unholy is what we must follow. What God says is clean and unclean is what we must follow. Because when you read these commandments, you, you, you can ask yourself, what's wrong with this? What if we can do other way? What if this thing is painful for me? It's, it's difficult for me. No, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. What does God want? What does God see as clean? Then that is what I and you must become. We can't go and tell God and say, God, you know what? This is clean. This is unclean. So accept it. No, 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 no. That's man-centered religion. That's man-centered worship. You are centering worship on you. No. We must center worship on God. And these rules, you see them, the priest. You have to go to the priest. Who must check you and determine you are clean or you are unclean. The priest will then do that work. And then if you are unclean, then you are separated. Then you must first be clean, healed and then be clean. Because that is the job or the responsibility that was given to the priest. To determine, representing God, teaching the people what is clean and unclean. Let's read in Leviticus 10, verse 9 to 11. It says, Drink no wine or strong drink, you or your sons with you. He was talking to Aaron, the priest. When you go into the tent of meeting, otherwise you die. It shall be a statute or a law forever throughout your generations. You are to distinguish between holy and uncommon, and between unclean and clean. You are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. So they have to be sober-minded. They have to be clear-minded so that they can see clearly, they can teach clearly, they can examine clearly, this is clean, this is not clean. That is the responsibility of the priests, representing God, so that they maintain order. They make the arrangements of worship and community life according to what God says is clean and what God says is unclean. So the rules that we read here, they are emphasizing, they are teaching to the church, not just in the Old Testament, but also to us today, that things must be done according to the pleasure of God, according to the will of Jehovah. It is not me who must decide, I'm clean, this is clean. Whereas God is saying, this is unclean. Or I say, no, I don't understand God. Why are you saying this is unclean? Why are you saying I must follow this process to be clean? I want to decide my own process. Or because we have other religions, we have other cultures, we have other traditions. Let's go to the Moabites, let's go to the Philistines and see how they do their things. And we copy. No, 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 no. You must listen to Jehovah. He has revealed what is clean. How to be cleansed if you are unclean. And that is what we must follow. We must obey. So when a person gets examined and you are declared that you are unclean, they were then to live outside the camp. Uh, the condition of that sickness was not just okay to help people to maintain hygiene because some infections, they can spread to other people. So sometimes you must quarantine. So when you read here, this thing of quarantine, uh, self-isolation, we see it is always there. It, it was there in the Bible. We are talking of it now during coronavirus, but look at Leviticus 13. Quarantine seven days, another seven days, and, and all that. But this separation was not just about protecting against sickness spreading, but it was also to remind people of their sinfulness, not only because you sinned, you did something wrong, but we are sinful. We are affected by sin. The effects of sin are there in us. Even sickness is an effect, it's a result of being sinful or being in a sinful world. We are fallen mankind. And when you go outside the camp, 
it was where things were thrown away. It is only by God's mercy that you are accepted back. You are accepted before God. And it is not just about worship here on earth. But even in heaven, we are accepted by God. And we are clean before God. According to God's view. And it's very important that we must follow the rules of God. Because you cannot go to heaven and tell God and say, God, I want to enter into your heaven. No. You must listen to God. What is clean according to God? And that's why we must thank Jesus. That we, the dirty people, not just because of sin, but also the effects of sin. Jesus has come, associated with us, cleansed us. In Hebrews 13, verse 10 to 13. Hebrews 13, when he talks of the benefits of Jesus having done the work to cleanse us as priests, as the right sacrifice. And God has accepted his work. And now we are clean because of Jesus. It says in Hebrews 13, verse 10 to 13, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to it. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify. Sanctify means to make holy, to make clean the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. So the main focus, beloved, is that we must not be outside the camp of heaven. We must not be outside the gate of heaven where we are unclean, where the unclean will be. You must be clean and be inside heaven, the camp. And that's why Revelation 21, verse 22 to 27, I'll read a few verses there. It says, I saw, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Verse 26 and 27. Revelation 21. They will bring into that city the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So whatever we are doing, culture, traditions, they must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, by the word of God, according to the way God wants things to be done. Otherwise, those things are unclean. They are outside. They cannot get into heaven. We will be unclean if we are not clean according to the requirement of God. And what is the requirement of God for you and I? Jesus Christ. Believe. Accept. His death. It is the one that makes you clean. It is not you who decide for yourself. Maybe you follow your ancestors. You follow your own pleasure. And you decide for yourself, you know what, I, I, I'll make myself clean. Hey, it's Sunday, I, I will dress myself clean. No. It's about the blood of Jesus. So it's important that as church, even today as churches, we must emphasize this fact. We must submit to God's way of salvation. We must submit to God's way of worship. How does God want to be worshipped? How does God want people to approach him? How does God want you to live for him? But if you go around, go through life thinking, no, I'm clean on my own, then you don't accept the cleansing of Jesus Christ. Then you are unclean. Don't be surprised. You are deceiving yourself when you come to heaven. You are called unclean. So these laws are helping the people here on earth. This is what God requires as clean. This is what is unclean. When you are unclean, this is what you must do so that God accepts you. So it was starting in the Old Testament, coming to us after the New Testament so that we can see we don't make ourselves clean. We must look at God. What does God say is clean? If we are unclean, how does God say we must be clean? And it all points to Jesus Christ. But if as church, our worship is all about our pleasure. People, what, 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 what do you think you want? What pleases you? then that's where you find people, they call themselves Christians, but their worship, their faith, it's about them. 
It's about us. What pleases us. It's centered on us and not on God. But the third thing, these laws regarding leprosy and cleansing, being unclean and being cleansed, they involved examination, which is teaching us humility to be humble and to be patient in regard even to, to knowledge and also healing. You know, uh, when you read here in Leviticus 13 and 14, you hear a lot, the priest must examine, the priest must look, the priest must inspect. Uh, if this is leprosy, then they must reach a declaration, pronouncement, diagnosis that this is leprosy. Then you are unclean. And if the person is healed, they must again check. No, he's healed. He's clean. So it was a very serious thing because it would affect the person's life, the person's standing in the community, the person's standing before God. So those things had to be done right. So there was a process, examination. So the Lord gave these rules and also the ability to the priests to work as what today we would call medical examiners who would maybe examine and diagnose and say that, no, you are sick. So they would make this diagnosis regarding these various skin infections, which God is saying, this is unclean. If a person has this kind of infection, they are unclean. So you must check for these symptoms and, and this and this. So it's not the priests themselves deciding that this is unclean or the priests deciding that we must check these kind of symptoms. But it is coming from God who has revealed here. And yes, as people, we, they were then revealed and they will have to teach uh, the people. They will also have to teach the future generations of the priests. It will probably have to in include study. To be a priest, you will have to be study this, to be able to do these things. Go to school and learn uh, the priest school so that you can uh, lead the people in determining whether you are clean or unclean and do the right examination. So it's, it's important to, to, to say this because you might ask yourself, why are these laws here where people have to come to the priest, there's a tent of meeting, why doesn't it say, priest, go into the tent, make a prayer, make a sacrifice, and God will tell you if this person is having leprosy or not. But you find God didn't give that way. Where maybe people will have a vision. You know, I, I see in you, you have leprosy. No. There was examination. It was where you had to follow a process. You don't just assume. You don't just guess. But you have to examine the person looking at the symptoms. Like they are, they are mentioned here. The diseased area on the skin. Is the spot deep? Uh, is there swelling? And when there is swelling, maybe the, the flesh is visible. Look at the eyes. If you have been burnt, uh, is there some reddish white there on your skin? If you are itching, uh, is it deeper than the skin? All those things. Or if you are bald, is it red, white, and then maybe you have leprosy? All those things. List of symptoms. As I said, it's not one disease. It's not one infection. But you had to examine. So God instructed the priest to make examination so that they come to the right diagnosis for each person. It was not the person who examined themselves, declared themselves sick or un uh, un unclean. It was not uh, the priest just doing some guess or ritual to guess if you are sick or not. Or maybe you look in the past, all of you are sick. No. You must examine. Every case has its own merits. That's what sometimes, even in the Reformed Church, when you talk of uh, dealing with issues, every case has its own merits. No case is the same. So, But you find people talking of precedences and all that. No. Every case has its own merit. Every person who presents himself before the priest had to be examined and then they will say, yeah, when we look at your case, when you look at your situation, when you look at your condition, you are unclean. Or no, you are clean. So the priests had to follow a process. It was important so that they reach the right conclusion. And sometimes it will happen that when they inspect and examine, they are not sure. They don't have all the information. They don't have enough to reach a conclusion. And that's why you find quarantine. 
if you see something okay let's quarantine seven days after seven days let's check but if we are not sure again seven days after that we observe we examine and sometimes you will find that you might be checked one two three and you are not sick or you are unclean but then after being checked the third time you find that how oh, country now it's manifesting now the disease or the infection is revealing itself it's like even today when people have to go for tests sometimes because now we have better things we can test blood and everything but sometimes we don't get conclusion it's inconclusive and you have to be tested again and sometimes it's you ask yourself why but it's because as people we don't know everything we can't know everything and this calls for humility this calls for patience because in getting to the answers getting knowledge making decisions these kind of decisions you have to be patient you have to be humble and that's why you see there is quarantine and uh, sometimes observing after seven days after seven days after seven days sometimes when we go let's say to the priest we'll be expecting the priest to see everything to know everything no sometimes they will not see everything they will not know everything uh, because the evidence the symptoms are not showing and giving them enough information to reach the full conclusion so even you as a patient you need to be patient you need to be humble uh, things won't happen the time in the time and process you want sometimes we'll fight with doctors and nurses uh, why am i not uh, getting healed why is our person not getting healed maybe you are at fault but sometimes you must understand there are people uh, they don't know everything even with the signs of today it doesn't mean we'll have all the answers we'll know when you'll be healed uh, how sick you are sometimes it's things that happen on their own and then that's when we see oh i'm sick this person is sick is serious and and, and 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 so forth so even with healing because sometimes people expect healing immediately immediately no sometimes it won't take a, a day sometimes it will take a week months even years some people will not even be healed from the sicknesses that they get and that is what we must learn even from this loss to be humble to be patient even when we talk of sickness and health and this process of being cleansed when you are unclean but it also talks to spiritual health to our spiritual growth uh, because this kind of sickness leprosy even leprosy of today you'll find that when you read it's, it's, it's a slow process which takes time for a person to, to to manifest that they have leprosy and it is a reminder also that even when you talk of the spiritual health sin can affect us over time and you find that the person they are worse but it started little by little but even when you talk of growth it is also a process you don't just grow in one day after one sermon after one prayer after attending one conference and you think you have grown no it is a process it is a process and the church must examine the leaders must examine they must teach and be patient in teaching. And that is what we need. And that is what we are taught about here. Uh, we are not perfect, but we have to grow. We have to learn. We have to be taught. And that's what we see from these instructions about examination and all that. But number four, the regulations about leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed, they encourage you to be loving and consider other people as well. Because when we are talking of these laws and the possibility that a person could be called you have leprosy, you are unclean and then you have to go to the priest and when you see, hey, maybe I'm going to be unclean. Hi, now I'm not going. Now I'm not going to test. Now I'm not going to be examined. Some people were afraid of knowing. But we must know so that we can protect others. But when you don't care about other people, then you don't know and you might be putting other people in danger and that's what we see here uh, yes we might be afraid because leprosy was a very serious thing there was stigma you can even call it stigma where people will be shamed you are separated and now you are afraid maybe you'll be afraid or you'll be looking at yourself I bet, uh, my business will be i won't be participating in business 
uh, family, I'll be away from family. So it's better I keep quiet. It's better I don't follow these laws. But then why are you doing that? You are looking only at yourself. Because these laws will put other people in danger. Will make others also unclean before God. But also it will affect other people's health. When you stay with the knowledge or you don't go and test, but then you don't follow the rules of quarantine. It's like even today, when you talk of coronavirus, wear the mask and all that, but you find people saying, no, I don't want to wear the mask. But then, if you are sick, you infect other people. So the person who was diagnosed to have leprosy, skin disease, which makes them to be unclean. Obviously, they will stay outside. That's what you see in verse 45 and 46, outside the camp. They will be marked. You will be wearing torn clothes, uh, hair hanging loose, covering your upper lip. Yeah, you see, the, even mask was there in the Old Testament. Mask covering the upper lip. So it means that you, you are covering yourself. And then when somebody comes near you, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean, don't come near me. That's what they were to do. Why? So that they also protect others. Concern for others. Consider others. Not only yourself. Yes, it's painful to go and stay alone, to go and stay outside the camp, to be separated from others. But it was also out of love. Consider the community. Consider others who might be affected by your sickness, infection. Consider others who might then be called unclean as well in front of God. So it was also about love. And that's why even today, when we talk of sickness, infections, knowledge, and we know that this which I have can be passed on to others, can infect others, can make others sick, then we must go to the doctor. We must do what is required, not just to protect ourselves, but also to protect others. And that's why even today there is what we call notifiable diseases, communicable diseases, which if you are sick, you must communicate to the, the doctor or you must communicate to the authorities, health authorities, because they are dangerous. They can affect the whole community. That's why even when you talk of coronavirus, some people are blaming China. Uh, why didn't you tell us earlier? And so forth. So those kind of questions, I'm not saying they are to blame. I'm just saying that when we have knowledge, then we must communicate to the relevant authorities. That's what these laws were about. And it was to be done not just out of obedience, respect of God, but also out of love. And love is not just about you being selfish, thinking about yourself, but think also for others. As Jesus also, he didn't think of himself, but he came thinking for us, thinking of us to be saved, to be cleansed. We must not think of our comfort, but sometimes our comfort will be inconvenienced, will be taken away, but for the sake of saving others. So it's important that if we know not just leprosy, but even other sicknesses, that you know these sicknesses can affect other people, then tell them. I'm not just talking of corona. Some even sexual sicknesses, transmitted infections, all those things, you know, but then you don't care. You infect others. So these laws remind us that we are part of a community and we must play our part so that order is happening in the community, but also the welfare of the community. Jesus has saved us to be his body, to be church, to be community. And we must have laws. And for those laws to happen, we need to play our part. We need to think for the welfare of the community. Not just for myself, but sometimes I might be sacrificed for the welfare of their community. So we must watch out that we don't infect others. And not just infect others' health, but even with spiritual disease. We can infect with spiritual disease by speaking lies, gossip, slander, false teaching. And you find that people are no longer healthy, are no longer strong in Jesus Christ. They are discouraged. They are unmotivated. They are rebelling against God. Why? Because you have got spiritual sickness. You don't listen to God. You hate Jesus Christ. You hate the laws of God. 
And then what do you do? You go around telling people, hey, we must not follow the laws of God. We must not do what the leaders are saying we must do. We must not work together. Let's mobilize against these Moses and others. That's spiritual sickness. You are spreading spiritual infection. And you are making the church sick. We must watch out for that. What we say. We must be building. We must be uplifting. It must be for the wealth or, or the health of the church. The health of others. But let me come to number five. The laws regarding leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed, was teaching us, was teaching people to trust in God and to thank God for health, for recovery. To trust God for recovery and thank God for health, for healing. That's what you see. Especially even, uh, not just in chapter 13, where it talks of possibility of a person being sick and then healed. But also especially in chapter 14, when he talks of the process of cleansing. Because here the focus is not on medication. Uh, obviously there would have been some thing which was used or prescribed and um, people could use it in those ancient times when you read you hear of some of the things that were used. But the main thing here was that yes, you can recover. You might recover. And this serious sickness, this serious infection that separated you maybe even for some months from the community, from God, from worship. Now you are healed. Thank God. Acknowledge God. You are covenant people. You are people of Jehovah. He is your God. He gives you healing. Don't go to the other gods. But trust in Jehovah. That's why these rules are there. And the laws of cleansing were made to confirm, yes, that indeed you are healed, you have recovered. You don't just declare yourself that you are healed. But again, you go to the priest. The priest is called, is examining you, examining the person. Yes, you are healed. Confirmation, you are healed. And then you start the process of getting back into the community, reintegration into the community and into the worship. But when you read these laws, you must see that people were being taught, the church was being taught, we are being taught to thank God, to acknowledge God for our health, for our healing. But how many of us, when we are healed, do we thank God? Maybe we remember the doctor, the hospital, the medical aid, the medicines. But do you thank God? And this is what is being taught here. This declaration that you are having leprosy and a person is unclean, it was very major. It was like a major event of sickness or, or health which would affect life, would affect your participation in, even in the community. And then when healing comes, it is because of God's mercy, God's grace, God's power. And when you know Jehovah, you thank him. That's why they are called to go to the priest, come to the tent of meeting, and thank God. Follow this process of thanking God. And that's what we see even in the New Testament when Jesus healed uh, people who had leprosy. For example, you read in Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 19, where outside the city, uh, there, there were 10 people who had le leprosy and they were standing far from Jesus and uh, they were asking Jesus, can you have mercy on us? Please help us, heal us. And you see Jesus healing them. In Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42, there was a man also, Jesus, please make me clean. And let me read Mark chapter 1, verse 40 to 42. If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and uh, healed and touched him and said to him, I will, I will be clean. So it is because of mercy. You see this person asking for mercy. Mercy is when uh, it's not just feeling sorry, but uh, it's a reversing, which, reversing something which we, we deserved actually. Uh, as, as I once made, there is grace. Grace, you are being given something good which you don't deserve. But mercy is when something you deserve is being taken out. Something bad which you deserve or which we, is on us is being reversed. Uh, so that's why we talk of grace and mercy. You get forgiveness. We're supposed to be punished is taken away. God's wrath is taken away. So we must always, even when you talk of health, even when you talk of healing, it's not us 
it's not something we deserve. You know, sometimes people claim it. It's like, I deserve it. It's my right to be healthy. No, we don't deserve it. It's a gift. We are given to be healthy. We are given healing. It's a gift from God. And we must thank God for that. Life is also a gift from God. Life can end any time. God is the one who gave us life. Is the one who gave us time here on earth. Is the one who gives us even the health that we have. I'm not saying that you must not exercise and eat well and all that. We must do that. But it's in God's hands. We thank God for health. We thank God for healing. We pray to God trusting in him for recovery. And it's in his power and love to can help us. So that is very important. And that's what these laws are pointing us to. Because you can just be healed and then you go on your own. No. But come to the tent of meeting and thank God. And follow this process of coming before God. Then the last thing. Number six, these laws regarding leprosy, being unclean and being cleansed, emphasize the need that, yes, you are forgiven. You are accepted by God. Your sins are atoned. Then you must give your life to God. You must dedicate your life to God. When we say we thank God, it's not just, okay, thank you God, prayer and all that. No, but it's also an event that should help you to Look at yourself and say, yeah, I could have died. God saved me. I must now live in a different way. Now I give my life to God. Or I renew myself. I renew my commitment for God. You know, this process of cleansing that we are reading in chapter 14 after healing, of course, it had three processes. The first stage, first process, you are checked by the priest. Uh, you are called a person to be cleansed then there are two beds that are taken one is killed the blood is uh, of, over the water then that blood mixed with water is sprinkled on, on, on the person uh, and then the other bed is dipped is put into the blood of the uh, blood of the bed which was killed and then it flies away uh, showing that indeed you, 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 you are healed but then stage 2 is that you will live seven days outside your tent. Now you are no longer outside the camp. You are now outside your tent. And then on the seventh day you wash your, 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 your clothes and you shave off the hair to indeed confirm that indeed I, there is no sign of, of leprosy. But then stage three or third process from verse 10, chapter 14, then you have to bring two sheep or two lambs and with flour and oil. And then those things, what, what are they going to be done? The other lamp will be killed and uh, the blood, uh, some of it will be put on your ear, on your right thumb, on the big toe of your right foot and the oil as well. You put it on the uh, ear, the right thumb and the right big toe and some of the oil is put on your head. So that process, what was it about? Uh, yes, it was expensive, to be honest. And you can see that the person could have been affected economically when they were in quarantine for a long time. So that's why you must bring for them. That's why in chapter 14, um, in, in, in verse 2 and 3, it, it talks about those things being brought for the people who are healed, who are to be cleansed. So the family, uh, the, the church will provide these animals and the things they needed for the cleansing so but also in chapter 14 verse 21 if the person could not afford then they could use instead of two lamps then they can bring only one lamp but then two beds one the lamp will be for a sin offering and then the second lamp or the two beds will be for the bent offering so it was a, a process it was expensive but it was necessary because god commanded it and people had to follow those rules, follow those steps, so that they can be accepted by God. They must not shortcut. So we see here in Leviticus that indeed a lamb without blemish, without any wrong thing on it, is needed. So that sinners can be accepted. So it was pointing to the need for sacrifice. Where uh, it must be a sacrifice that pleases God. That God accepts. Don't come with sacrifice of dead animals or sick animals and you think God will accept your sacrifice. No. 
So it was pointing to the fact that Jesus, who will be our sacrifice, our lamp, he must be without sin. He must be sinless. He must be perfect. And that's why Jesus is our lamp. God accept his death because he was without sin. He was the lamp without blemish. But then also the shedding of blood, the killing of the animal and blood being shed, sprinkled, it is showing that our sins, our sinfulness deserved death. And God has made the way. Accepting something to die in our place. Blood equals life. Life is taken. Your life, my life is spared. We should be killed for our sins, for being unclean. But what happens? God has shown in Leviticus what in English we call substitutionary atonement. Substitution, replacement. Atonement means that something is offered, something is paid because you are guilty. You have made someone angry. And there is something that must be paid on your behalf. And that is what was done by Jesus Christ. And when you believe Jesus, indeed, his death is the one that pays for your sins. You are accepted by God. You have peace with God. You have reconciliation with God. Only Jesus. Only faith in Jesus. He has done enough. And that is the assurance you must have. Not just for worship here on earth. Not just for every sin, every situation that might hinder you from God. By the blood of Jesus, you are cleansed. God accepts you. God hears your prayer. You can be accepted by God. But not just here on earth, but even when we talk of eternal life, even when we talk of heaven. Because look at this process. Some people will look at this process and say, you know, when a person dies, uh, you, you still have some sin. You are still unclean. Some people even teach that when you die, you go to a place between heaven and earth. And in that place, you are still being cleansed. You are still being punished for your sins so that your sins now are being cleansed. No. When you have Jesus, today, here on earth, you are clean. When you die in Jesus and you are believing in Jesus, you are going straight to heaven. There is no process that must still happen after death. That's why sometimes when people think like that, then they come with strange rituals, strange processes regarding funerals. Because we think there is something that must still be done for the dead person. Maybe you find people thinking that this person who's, die, who's dead must go and join the ancestors. So for them to join the ancestors and be accepted by the ancestors, let's slaughter these, let's bury them in this way, let's clean them in this way, this is the process, so that they can be accepted in their next life. And you find Christians also thinking like that. No, we need this, that the pastor must touch the box, uh, you, you must pray like this. And you find all those rituals and people putting oil on dead people, thinking that, when a person is dead, they need cleansing so that they can go to God. No! Those things don't work. Those traditions don't work. That's false belief, brothers and sisters. In Jesus Christ, when you believe, everything has been done. The whole process has been done for cleansing you. When you die, you are going straight to God. You are going to be accepted by God. But if you don't have Jesus, if you are adding other things, that's where it's wrong. So these laws regarding leprosy and being cleansed, it's not just, okay, believe in God. Be assured that God, by his grace, has accepted you. This priest has worked, and now you are accepted. The priest for today is Jesus Christ. But these laws were for us, for the people of God, to dedicate themselves to God. Because you are saved, you are redeemed. You are set apart for God. Dedicate your life to God. Look at these laws where you have to put the blood on the ear, right ear, on the right thumb, on the right foot. It is so that now you dedicate yourself to listen to God. You have put blood on the right hand or oil on the right hand. Now you are serving God. You are going to serve righteousness. The blood is and the oil is put on the right foot, right big toe. 
I'm going to walk in the laws of God. Oh, Jesus has saved me. Not just from health uh, scare or sickness. Now I'm healed. Now I must continue giving my life to God. Listening to God. Doing works of righteousness. But with my feet, I'm walking in the law of God. Not only when you talk of health. But also, Jesus saving you from sin. Jesus saving you from hell. Spiritual sickness. Sickness of sin in your heart. You are released. You are liberated by Jesus Christ. You are washed. Then, you give yourself to God. You are born again by the Holy Spirit. By the word of God, you are made anew. That is a gift that God gives to those he loves. To his people. So that we are clean. We are healthy. We are united with God. We have the life of God. We have fellowship with God. Oh, then you say, God, I give myself to you. But when we don't understand how we are saved, what we are saved from, that's when even you find people when they were sick, the first thing when they get healing, they go to the bottle store. Look at what happened just now. Level 2 was decreased, level 3 to level 2. The first thing people think about is beer. It's alcohol. We just want to get drunk. We just want to get drunk. Oh, coronavirus didn't kill me. Hey, now the government has opened for us. Let's go to bottle store and get drunk. How? Is that how you thank God and you look at your health like that? Ah, brothers and sisters. Yes, we must take seriously our health. When we are healed, we must take seriously our health. We must not waste our life. But not wasting your life means giving your life to God. Doing what is righteous. Doing things in the right way improved way. That's why these laws are there. Where a person will be unclean, sick. But then there is a cleansing, recovery. It helps them then to say, no Mara, hi God has saved me. Let me give myself to God. And indeed, that's what we must do. We should be rushing to church, to gather, to meet and say, God, thank you. We must be joining the chorus, the crowd of the redeemed and the ransomed. Because that's what even in heaven we'll be doing. Oh, God has made us clean. By the blood of the lamb we are clean. Now we have white robes. By the blood of Jesus we are clean. We are in heaven. That's what will be happening there. And we start to show it here. May God help you. That indeed the cleansing of Jesus cleanses you. And you dedicate your life for him. Amen. Let us... Uh, let us pray. I will lead you in prayer. Oh, Jehovah, thank you for this word. Thank you for your grace, for your wisdom. You care for us as people. You know us that even though we are the ones who disobeyed you and we fell into sin and now we are affected by sin, even sicknesses and our relationship with you is affected, we can't come before you. We are unclean before you. But we thank you that by your grace you have made the way. You have made the rules whereby people could know what is unclean and clean. But also how to be clean according to your way. We thank you for these rules where you show the importance of the priest and the sacrifice for atonement and for sin. And all of this, oh God, we thank you very much knowing that we as the church of the New Testament, after the New Testament, we know that Jesus Christ has followed this process, is the right priest, is the right sacrifice, and in him we are cleansed. Give us peace, give us assurance. Oh God, even in times of sickness, help us to trust in you, help us to obey you, help us to also live for you, knowing that in Jesus we are accepted. Help us, oh God, that not only as we look at our life here on earth, but also knowing that our life continues with you after death, then we know that we are clean in Jesus Christ. We are accepted into eternal life, into the camp of the saved, the camp of the redeemed. We thank you, God, for this promise. We thank you, God, for this arrangement. Help us to have love to you and thankfulness and gratitude. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Beloved, let us uh, then continue to praise God and let us sing the song which says, The Great Physician Now 
Ismia. accept God's blessing from Numbers chapter 6 uh, verse 22 um, sorry verse 24 to verse 26 and be assured that God is with you every time and indeed put your trust and hope in him <clears throat> the Lord Jehovah bless you and keep you may Jehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Beloved, may the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God our Father and fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Beloved, I end by saying thank you. Thank to God. Praise be to God. And indeed, let us continue to worship him and trust him. And let us end by singing the song uh, When he cometh, when he cometh. Indeed, when he comes, uh, is going to take us as jewels we are cleansed and we are going to shine like the stars in heaven forever and praise Jesus that's uh, what this song is talking about when he cometh when he cometh thank you to make up his jewels all his jewels precious jewels he loved Stars of the morning, his brightness are dawning, they shall shine in the beauty.
Ти, Брайджем, Слой, Скрам, Гада, Ива, Гада, Виджем, Слой, Скиндом, All the pure ones, all the bright ones, His love and His own, Like the stars of the moon, His brightness adorning, They shall shine in the beauty, bright gems for his crown. Little children, little children, who love their Redeemer, are the jewels, precious jewels, his love that this own, like the stars of the morning, his brightness adorning. They shall shine in the beauty, bright gems for his crown.